Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Oram Institute and FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics, I would like to welcome you all to this exciting TB Month webinar, uh, which is entitled Invest to Find TB to End TB. Um, I hope you can all hear me well. Firstly, yes. let me great. Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Violet Chihota. I am a chief specialist scientist at the Oram Institute in Johannesburg, South Africa, which I, which I guess is why I keep saying 4 p.m. South Africa time, uh, working in TB and TB HIV co-infections. Um, I will be moderating this session with my esteemed colleague, um, Dr. Kavi Villen, a senior scientist at FIND, the Global Alliance for Diagnostics. He's based out in Geneva, Switzerland, and Kavi currently works across TB and access programs at FIND. Um, just, to, just to remind us again of the, the, the purpose of this webinar, I think as you all know, in 2020, approximately 4.3 million people fell ill with TB. And majority of them went undiagnosed and were not reported. And so when we look at the theme of the World TB Day, which is to invest um, to end TB, saves lives, it kind of conveys the urgent need to invest resources to ramp up the fight against TB. And one key element in fighting TB is really case finding, as we all know. Uh, case finding is really crucial, is a crucial first step to accessing TB treatment prevention, and maybe we can broadly call it TB care. And so from diagnostics and linkage to appropriate care are essential to achieving the NTB strategy uh, goal, which is to free to be a world free of TB in 2035. And really 2035 is already looming. Um, the, the hard work that had gotten into TB, of course, was uh, impacted uh, by COVID-19 and um, more so uh, on, on the people that were had TB during this period. And because of reduced access to diagnostic, diagnostics and treatment, uh, we had a lot of, um, we had increased deaths, deaths during this period. And this was an increase that we first observed for the first time in over 10 years. And then on the other hand, COVID-19 accelerated innovation in uh, development of uh, molecular diagnostic platforms in particular. And we saw the use of non-sputum-based sampling techniques with COVID. And some of these can actually be repurposed for TB. Um, in today's webinar, we will hear about TB diagnostic strategies that can facilitate improved access to testing. And we have a lineup of presenters who are going to be talking to some very interesting strategies that could you know, be scaled up or adopted in different countries. Um, before we, we go on, I thought we should just give you a few um, sort of housekeeping um, comments. Uh, we would, would want to encourage our guests to use the question and answer chat. Um, so what will happen is in the first session, we'll have six speakers presenting on innovative strategies that they have uh, evaluated and um, or are currently evaluating that could potentially improve case finding and identify the large number of um, the cases of TB that have been missed. And so we encourage uh, the guests to use the Q&A chat. Um, please post your questions there. Uh, the questions are very useful for, for the speakers, most of who are researchers, and they would, it will help really improve the work that they're currently conducting or planning to do. And we'll be monitoring the chat as we go and answering your questions. Uh, following the first three, three presentations, we'll have a very brief Q&A session. And um, after this, we'll move swiftly to the next set of talks. And my co-chair, um, Dr. Villan uh, will also then introduce the, the, the speakers and host the Q&A session. Um, then following the presentations, we will have a panel of discussion and the panel, uh, panelists include presenters from a number of um, high TV burden countries. And they're going to talk about their experiences in adopting new developments in case finding. And we are hoping that as guests to this webinar, um, you will be able to also 
think through how you could potentially ad adapt some of the strategies in your own settings. Uh, with that, um, I will now uh, stop and maybe we move on to the presentation. Kavi, I don't know if at this point you want to add anything before we start the presentation. Thanks very much, Violet. Actually, just to say welcome again um, on behalf of uh, FIND and the Orm Institute. And um, I think you've set the scene for our you know, discussions today. We look forward to some robust discussions. And I think I'll leave it to you to introduce uh, Professor Leslie Scott, and we'll take it from there. I'll see you guys on the other side. Thank you, Kavi. So our first presenter is Professor Leslie Scott, um, and she is based at the University of Witwatersrand. She's an associate professor and head of research and development in the Department of Molecular Medicine and Hematology, and I lead in the Faculty of Health Sciences at that university. Uh, Leslie has a PhD in molecular medicine with over 20 years experience in accelerating innovative HIV and TB diagnostics and quality programs from concept to implementation. Um, in April 2020, Leslie and her team applied R&D and evaluation protocols to COVID-19 to assist in recommendation for medical devices regulation and implementation in South Africa. With that introduction, I will um, also then quickly move on to introduce the rest of the speakers for this session before Leslie kick starts her presentation. We will then just have all presentations at once. Uh, following Les, uh, Leslie's presentation, Dr. Katamba, Achilles Katamba, will also present on uh, decentralized molecular testing for TB. Achilles is a senior lecturer in the Department of Medicine, College of Health Sciences at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. He's a clinical epidemiologist with over 15 years of experience in the design, conduct, and implementation of health services research in uh, hospital and community based best settings. He also serves as the Uganda head of uh, TB implementation research consortium. Um, Dr. Katamba is, is undertaking quite a number of uh, high quality clinical and epidemiology and implementation research. Um, following his talk, we will then have Professor Salome Chalambas, uh, who is a physician and a PhD epidemiologist at the Oram Institute. Salome will be talking about the universal testing for TB amongst uh, TB contacts. She has led many implementation research projects, including large multi-site and multidisciplinary cluster randomized trials in TB and HIV. She is the principal investigator on the CAR-TB project, which she's going to be presenting on. Um, and she, she's done a lot of work uh, in household contacts in South Africa, Tanzania, and uh, Lesotho. Uh, with that introduction, um, I would now leave the presenters to give their talks. And just to remind people to post your questions in the Q&A chat. Thanks, over to you, Leslie. Thanks very much, Violet, uh, for that introduction. And hello to everybody. And thanks for the opportunity to be able to share some of our recent research and development work uh, with the group. I have to say, though, that this is um, really from a, a larger group. And I've, I've listed some of our, our researchers and uh, pathologists uh, within the National Priority Program of the NHLS, uh, which really is where we provide our research and development for implementation and recommendation to national programs. So this is really on behalf of a broader team. So I'm going to really talk to you today about swab-based testing for TB, what have been our, our experiences, um, as this type of specimen as being an alternative to sputum and really can it be used um, to find TB? And I know, Violet, you gave a really good background, but I thought it would be quite nice to, to share some of the South African um, highlights of where really over the past two years, um, pandemics have collided and really shown that health priority programs have been damaged by COVID. 
as Violet mentioned, pre-COVID era, you know, 10 million people become ill annually, but the declining incidence has really been seen, there's been a decrease in mortality. And then of course, since COVID, large number of specimens um, have reduced in their numbers between 2019 and 2020. There's been 18% reduction in TB case notifications over the two years. And really, as Violet mentioned, there's the first time we've seen an increase in, in the death rate within the last decade. So within the South African environment, and this is shared on behalf of the National Priority Program of NHLS, if we look at the percentage change in in 2020-2021 of the test volumes relative to the corresponding month in 2019, you can see that in the HIV program, sorry, I just want to move this. In the HIV program, the early infant diagnostic um, number of tests were actually still increasing during COVID. So were the HIV viral load tests. So access was still possible during the hard lockdowns of COVID, but dramatically we can see the decline in the TB numbers. So these are actual numbers of specimens that were um, really not received at the NHLS. And you can see that this decline happened hard in the first lockdown uh, phases. Within the last uh, six months, um, TV numbers of specimens has increased, but it really does highlight the damage from COVID. So I thought I'd mention a recent series from, from Lancet, uh, which has really looked at the TV programs in the era of COVID and, and around the restoration priorities. And here you can see the three main groups of resource allocation, case finding and prevention, and treatment as main priorities. And I've highlighted in black that really this features a firm message for the role of diagnostics and the urgent call for action. We need to improve diagnostics with dual testing for molecular tests, reduce the turnaround time, and improve specimen transportation, as well as enhance screening. So what did we learn from COVID um, around diagnostics? Well, certainly there's a rich pipeline of diagnostics that we saw um, with COVID. There were no boundaries to the development of diagnostics. There was rapid development, rapid evaluation, even reference materials were more easily available. There was rapid regulation and rapid implementation and uptake. There were many open and closed testing platforms available for COVID molecular testing. Many were multiplex, many were multi-purpose instruments, and many were easily and readily interfaced. The acceptance and diagnostic adaption to alternative specimen types was also seen. Nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal, nasal, and saliva were easily collected. They were easily collected by healthcare workers, and they were even um, well received by self-collection. Testing was everywhere from point of care to centralized. We saw testing in mobile vans, at care homes, at schools, even drive-throughs. It was easy development and adoption of digital healthcare technologies, rapid development and easily accepted, uh, but really did also highlight the legacy systems uh, had challenges. The increased data visibility and access through dashboards, webinar forums, and this was at a global level of buy-in. Uh, they were readily available for national um, training, which is really fantastic to see this kind of development and the pipeline. And if you have a look at our experience, our group is uh, one of the groups that collaborate with the in-country SAPRA regulator in South Africa where we validate um, several of the COVID diagnostics. You can see a really enormous landscape of diagnostics around the serology, the antigens, the RT-PCR assays, the huge numbers of tests that were being developed and being submitted for validation. 
And of course, a large number of them fell out the bottom for recommendation and therefore uptake. This has not really been the case for TB. And so we looked at um, alternative specimens, specimen collection and alternative ways to finding TB. And I'll talk a bit more on the tongue swabs. So published studies, and I have to say, this is a growing literature, um, initially showed confirmation that bacilli accumulate on the oral epithelia of pulmonary TB patients. Um, using a swab can limit aerosols and it's really non-invasive. So the literature shows us that cheek swabs were used initially, but they showed poor sensitivity on gene experts on ultra or PCR assays. Buccal cavity had some tests performed and did show some improved performance, but really only amongst very high bacillary burdens. Tongue swabs showed improved sensitivity, and there's several publications on this with sensitivities on the gene expert up to 88%. And even the use of multiple swabs combined increased sensitivity. Testing is possible in children and even showed better yields than induced sputum and definitely less invasive. Testing is possible with multiple platforms. You can see I've given examples, the gene expert, the ultra, other quantitative PCR assays, even the TB lamp. But the investigations did highlight that we require correct collection procedures. There are even video training options now to help healthcare workers optimize tongue collection. Um, we ensure stability during transport, that is critical. The compatibility with current testing uh, processes and workflows within the lab as well as point of care needs to be investigated. The adaptability to current molecular testing platforms needs to be further reviewed. And of course, integration into existing diagnostic algorithms. So this is great innovation, but we do need to fit it into our current um, algorithms. So within our group, we looked at in-house research and development, and we showed using two different types of, flo of flocked swabs from Steripak and from Copen, that if you use different dilutions of H37 RV cultures, comparing liquid to the swabs, we showed minimal variation using external quality assessment material, also in a liquid format versus the swab. We showed high cycle thresholds using the direct method. In other words, swabs actually captured a lot more bugs. Decontamination with NALC NaOH did, however, reduce the CT values, um, but didn't really affect the performance. Swabs that were incubated in the gene expert sample reagent buffer for up to 60 minutes also showed no performance changes. Swab capture in the presence of normal mouth flora did show some reduced release of MTB from the swabs. But the performance of the Copen swabs versus Steripak showed no difference. An elution of swab in the SL buffer versus phosphate buffer showed no difference. So really a lot of work is going into the optimal type of swab, optimal type of technology. But there are challenges, which are also opportunities for innovation. Not all swabs are the same and not all technologies are equal. So here I've represented some of the work that we've done from the swab experience in COVID, different types of swabs. You can see the different um, material that are used to make them up, even different types of shaft, uh, shafts. Transport can be dry or in buffers. There's issues with temperature and humidity. And specimen stability, we really saw the value of an endogenous controls. But if you look at the recent centralized molecular evaluation that our group performed in collaboration with FIND, and you rec remember the funnels I just showed you for COVID, look how few there are of molecular diagnostics for TB. They do show differences in their front end processing and their targets, their extraction and back end PCR. But all of this is good work to be able to see the type of compatibility between different swabs and different types of uh, molecular technologies.
So in our particular study, we've undergoing a clinical evaluation on a cohort of adults in the Johannesburg area. A pre preliminary findings on small swab sub sample sizes, as you can see what's been represented. And these are also swabs that have been frozen prior to testing. And I've just highlighted uh, those um, compared to midget. So the first column is, is midget. Then the gene expert, uh, which is standard of care, self-collected swabs performed on the gene expert, and then two different and two new molecular diagnostics. You can see really good performance, even though it's variable. So swabs appear to be compatible with current molecular platforms. The variability we think is due to collection techniques or buffers or pre-processing um, methods. We certainly can see that swabs are capable of capturing even down to very low based on gene expert ultra technology. They can still capture that level of bacteria, uh, bacterial load. Participants um, are able to self collect swabs and actually show good performance. And of course, we know we need to expand the R&D to look for optimizing the front end processing as well as uh, molecular technologies. So just in ending, um, I really think we need to look at the considerations about using swabs as an alternative specimen type. We know that COVID showed that they can be successfully used. It's easy to train to collect um, these types of specimens. Patients certainly don't mind it and they're even happy doing self-swabbing. Laboratories certainly are sensitized to, the, to swabs as a specimen type and definitely happy with managing the different processing. But there's lots of innovation that's needed. We have to optimize molecular protocols. We have to do this at both point of care testing and Morton will tell you of the latest new technologies that are coming all the way through to highly centralized uh, systems. We have to determine the place for tongue swabs in existing diagnostic algorithms. Do we use one swab? Do we test at certain times and collect at certain times? Do we use swab plus sputum? Do we push to, to self swabs? And of course, expand this to other use cases, particularly in children. So there really is an urgent need to invest in diagnostics. We've seen what can be done for COVID. We have to get more buy-in from industry and from partners. And of course, alongside, we have to look at the models for implementation that will require changes and development. So it remains for me to just thank a broader team and our funders, the participants in the trial, as well as our partners. And I'll hand back to you, Violet. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for the fantastic presentation and reminding us again you know, that we do need alternative samples to sputum. Uh, we do know some people do struggle to, to produce sputum, so this is giving us a lot of hope that we can have alternative specimens. Uh, we'll move swiftly to um, Dr. Katamba's presentation. He's going to talk about decentralized molecular testing for TB. Over to you, Achilles. Yeah, good morning, good evening. Yeah, this is a study we did with colleagues, expert testing. As expert came in, it was thought to be a game changer. And there was a lot of expansion for molecular testing, significant donor and country investments. And there was rapid scale up of testing. And in Uganda, like any other countries, really, we scaled up gene expert devices. And the, because we could not put it everywhere, we adopted a hub and spoke model where the lower facilities could use border borders to bring samples to the hub where gene expert is. And generally, there was nearly fourfold increase in confirmed MDR TB patients. But the increase in total number of cases notified annually was not as what was expected. Similarly, the increase in proportion of bacteriologically confirmed TB was not as high as expected. 
The unresolved questions which we went on to answer with colleagues was how well are expert referral network, the hub and spoke model functioning? And what is the quality of TB diagnostic care within the expert referral networks? And what policy changes and co-interventions can further enhance implementation? So together with colleagues, we came up with the expert performance evaluation to facilitate linkage to TB care, which we call the expel TB. With three aims to quantify the gaps in TB diagnosis in health centers linked to expert testing sites, to identify modifiable barriers to high quality TB diagnostic services and they develop and evaluate a theory driven intervention to improve the quality of TB diagnostic service. We carried out this in Uganda and those dotted facilities. There were 24 health centers, which were the spokes, which were referring to 16 hub testing hubs. All the data collection was really not, we did not introduce any new tools in data collection. We just provided the phone to the facilities so that they take photos of the registers, the TB registers, about register, and send them to Red Cup database. And then our staff in Kampala would extract the data and resolve any queries by calling back those people and resolving any queries. So to address aim one of our work, the quality of TB diagnostic evaluation, we looked at the recommended international standards of TB care, to what extent are these being followed up in the health facilities? And we looked at 6,700 6, patients from January to December, 2017, and looked at those various indicators of quality of care. We found that overall, it was only 42% really that people were adhering to the international TB care, which meant that there was really poor quality of TB care. We looked at the issue of utilization of expert testing in those facilities. 20% of the patients in those were referred for expert testing, 33 only which were HIV positive. Whereas the guidance at that time was saying the first test for testing for any HIV should be expert, but only 33 of all those. And you can see only 6% of patients referred for expert test as first line test. 52% of expert positive patients initiated treatment within 42 days, 14 days. So high coverage of expert testing service does not necessarily equate to high quality care. Then we went further to understand the quality gap and we used the theory of planned behavior and looked at clinicians' intention to follow the international standard of TB care and that they have may be affected by their knowledge, skills, attitude, and patient factors, time or distance to access, cost of care, health systems factors, physical resources, and material. And so we conducted key informant interviews, field observation and surveys to understand the quality gap. And we use the precede framework to really identify the barriers to high quality TB evaluation along the predisposing enabling factors and reinforcing. And we found that among the predisposing factors, time and resource constraint due to high workload that the clinicians were facing, low self-efficacy, belief that TB evaluation is not urgent. Among the enabling, we found that failure of patients to return after initial visit due to time and costs, inconsistent late specimen transportation to expert testing sites, inability to track and follow up patients. And reinforcing factors, we found lack of communication and coordination among staff and insufficient. And so those were the barriers which also published in the various paper. So now we went to aim three, to improve the quality gap. So we looked at our barriers and reviewed evidence, did stakeholder consultation with the National TB program and others, and looked at how feasible even for the potential interventions. So we prioritized some of those barriers and selected interventions, and also specified how these interventions could be delivered. And that's how we came up with the expert TB 
intervention strategy, which has three components. It's a multi-component intervention, on-site expert testing using expert age. We are lucky they donated that. Deduced workload, increased speed, and accuracy of testing. We structured the clinic process, redesigned facilitate same day testing and treatment of TB to address lack of urgency and failure of patients to return. We provide the regular feedback of quality metrics to the healthcare facility to improve communication, coordination, and oversight. And we went to design the expert trial design and population. The objective was to evaluate the effectiveness, implementation cost, and cost effectiveness of the expert strategy at community centers. It was a cluster randomized trial. And we looked at all adults from October 2020. So we had the multi component diagnostic strategy for 10 sites and the routine care for 10 sites. And this on site molecular testing as first line test, streamlined clinical laboratory, and the monthly performance feedback. This one, Sputamusimia microscope, as the first line test. And they referred the high samples to the molecular testing. This is now made with the hub spoke model. To get a buy-in for all this, we conducted a randomization ceremony. We, our, the statistician, Professor Catherine from London School, he was, she was here in Uganda and did the restriction and stratified. And we invited the people from those 20 health facilities which participated. And they chose which group they belong to, whether control or intervention. And actually, there was very good buy in. They were all happy that we are control. We are not going to get the model. We shall continue referring and others. And this was also published in the Kinko. So, in terms of data collection, we waived informed consent. There was no, no twice specific changes in the data collection or any tests. And the outcome was assessed by just collecting data from those registers. And we were minimal contact with the health facilities just the initial training and the quarterly visits to the sort of any queries. The effectiveness outcome, primary outcome, number of patients treated for microbial confirmed TB within 14 days. And the second outcomes were really looking at the cascade of TB care along those metrics. The trial floor, really 20 of the 84 clinics and more than 10,000 patients others participated. There were just less than 2% who were excluded and the harmonic mean was higher for the intervention group. Patient characteristics, these groups were similar. And for the primary outcome, we found that the intervention, the expert intervention, it increased the number of adults who are confirmed for TB and treated within 14 days by 56%. And this has, was published in December. Similarly, with the secondary outcome, the cascade of care, there was high implementation, fidelity, and improved quality across the cascade of care. So the key limitations in this study was that potential imbalance underlying prevalence of TB and other factors by the trial arm, given relatively small numbers of clusters. Might facilitate the intervention effect of decentralized molecular testing alone is unknown. This is a molecule, a multifaceted intervention. Generalizability uptake and the impact of intervention strategy in other high burden countries. Conclusion scale up of novel diagnostics alone is unlikely to significantly increase case detection or improve patient outcomes. The expert strategy on site expert testing plus implementation support increased 14 day TB diagnosis and treatment by 56%. Improved quality metrics at each step along with the TB diagnostic evaluation cascade of care. National TB programs should consider decentralized molecular testing to close the cascade detection gap and improve quality of care. Implementation science-based methods are useful for designing and evaluating the system interventions to improve quality of care. I would like to thank who are led by Aditya Katamanchi and a number of people who are listed there from different institutions. 
and thanks to the funding was US National Institutes of Health, in expert devices were donated by SafeFit via find. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Achilles, and for reminding us that just having the tools alone will not solve the problem of TB. We need to think clearly of uh, strategies for implementing the, the tools. We'll move on to Prof. Um, Shalamba's presentation uh, on universal testing for TB among contacts. Over to you, Salome. And just to remind uh, our guests that please post your questions in the Q&A uh, chat. Thank you. Thank you, Violet, and thank you, Achilles, for making us aware of uh, your study and the, 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 the great uh, initiative of having expert testing at facility level. I'm going to be talking about universal testing for TB, um, and particularly amongst contacts, and, and just thinking about the different tools that we have available, and uh, Morton will talk about uh, you know, newer tools that are around. But currently we have an um, expert available and just thinking about where we can use it better. So just to, um, to go on to the global TB report, very similar to what Leslie showed us, is that the global trend in case notifications reduced dramatically in 2020. And we know that we still have a number of countries with huge gaps between the notifications and the number of instant TB cases. And amongst those countries is South Africa, India, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Nigeria. So all these countries need to find better ways to find the TB cases. So in South Africa, as has also been shown by Leslie, um, we've had a dramatic reduction of tests for TB um, during the, the COVID period, um, especially between March uh, 2020 and October 2020. Um, this, this, this is likely to increase the number of missing cases that we have. And um, our TB prevalence survey that uh, was done in 2018 and released last year showed that indeed the number, the estimates from WHO are correct and that there are large numbers of missing cases, uh, the estimate of 154,000 um, from 2018. But what was also very interesting from our TB prevalence survey was that of the TB cases that were identified, 60% uh, would have been found, it would only have been found because chest x-ray was used in the prevalence survey. So if we use the symptom screen, which is our current mainstay for diagnosis of TB, we would only have picked up around 42% of the cases. So this just identifies that firstly, we're not testing people enough. And then maybe the people that we're testing are also not the correct people to test for TB. So what about the idea of within very high risk groups, to do universal testing for TB without regardless of symptoms. And this has been looked in, in a number of different situations. Um, a study done amongst pregnant women um, in, in Soweto showed that uh, symptom screening had a very low sensitivity. Here, 1,415 pregnant women were, uh, were tested for TB using TB uh, smear microscopy and culture. And uh, what they found was that uh, a very small proportion of the cases that were picked up would have been identified if symptoms were used on their own. The feasibility of testing all TB contacts has been looked at before by uh, Dr. Neil Martinson and, uh, and Adrian Shapiro, and they, uh, they, they did uh, testing of all, all household contacts um, in, an, in, in the, the Clarkstorp area in, in the Northwest province of South Africa, and saw a high uptake of um, tests of, um, of, of, you know, of people producing sputum and a very high yield of TB amongst this group. And then the study done in Vietnam by Guy Marx in a community setting where all uh, community members were tested with expert annually for three years showed reduced TB prevalence. The, the use of expert for uh, testing for TB as, a, as the first line test um, has, has been looked at uh, you know, in the recent guidelines that have been released on, uh, by WHO on screening for TB. And they compared uh, the molecular WHO rapid diagnostic test um, versus uh, all of these other ways of identifying patients that need to be tested, and you know, including cough and then also chest radiography. 
And, um, you know, they, they didn't come up with a very high sensitivity, but I just want to caution everyone to look at this, um, this table that, that was in the guideline a little bit more carefully. And you'll see that there were only five studies that were looked at in this, in this um, you know, in this comparison. And in fact, only 337 TB patients amongst within those studies. So it hasn't been looked at as sufficiently to actually be able to, to make a case for that. And, and more recent studies have now come out that maybe uh, give, create, give more evidence towards the idea of universal testing for TB, especially amongst high-risk groups. In addition, all of these studies that are shown here are amongst general population groups, and, um, and uh, although two or three of them are actually from prison populations. So this study that was conducted uh, by uh, Dr. Neil Martinson and, and uh, Dimakatsu Labina um, was presented at CROI in 2021. Uh, and it looked at the idea of targeted universal testing. And so within the clinic setting, looking at people who are at high risk for TB and testing all those at high risk for TB, those who are HIV positive, previous TB and TB contacts. And they did a cluster randomized trial. And these are some of the, the highlights of the results. But what you can see here is a high yield of TB amongst um, this group of patients. This, these were tested for TB regardless of symptoms. And you can see even in those without symptoms, which is on the, the final column, 6.2% um, were found to have TB if you include trace and 3.7% if you exclude trace. Um, you know, and what this study showed was that a 17% increase in yield of TB cases in the targeted universal testing arm compared to the standard of care arm. Um, what we also see is that amongst TB contacts, the yield of TB was very, very high. So, um, so these studies from uh, the targeted universal testing has actually led to South Africa wanting to adopt targeted universal testing. And um, the new guidelines on TB preventive therapy would actually include that all contacts and HIV positive individuals need to be tested for TB. And we're, we're awaiting the release of those guidelines. So I'm now going to just present the CUT-TB project, which is a, a study which will be looking at universal testing for TB amongst TB contacts. The study will be done in three countries, South Africa, Lesotho and Tanzania, and has support um, from Karolinska University, University College London and Research Center Boston. And the CUT-TB project will be looking at the TB yield through universal testing compared to standard TB screening amongst TB contacts. We have some secondary objectives which include increasing the uptake of TB preventive therapy once we are able to exclude TB disease, improving TB uptake and preventive therapy amongst child contacts, we're also going to be looking at uh, LTBI treatment eligibility amongst TB contacts by doing LTBI testing and the TB yield amongst community TB contacts. This will be a cluster randomized trial um, with two phases. Phase one is 100 uh, TB index cases that will be enrolled and requested to, um, you know, to identify their contacts. And at, in this first phase, we will be doing the LTBI testing. And then in phase two, we'll be conducting a cluster randomized trial with randomization at the household level with approximately 600 households per country. And there we'll be mainly looking at the universal testing. So we've had to now revise this for the South Africa group because universal testing is likely to become standard of care and has already been implemented in a number of districts that are already supported through PEPFAR and the Global Fund. This is the project design. Um, you know, just in a schematic form. As I said, we'd have 100 index patients in the preparatory phase, 600 in the cluster randomized trial. We will be randomized to either universal testing or standard TB screening. And then a, a group of these will also have their community contacts investigated. This is just a schematic showing what will happen within the trial with index patients who uh, would be uh, patients who are greater than 18 and microbiologically confirmed, and they will be randomized to either standard of care, of care or the intervention. In the standard of care arm, uh, contacts will have symptoms investigated, um, and, then, and then from there, a test will be done. In the intervention arm, all contacts will be tested for TB regardless of symptoms. 
then those that are tested positive for TB who started on treatment, those negative, if they're symptomatic, are investigated further, and if they're not symptomatic, will be started on preventive therapy. We're now having to revise this slightly for the South African group where we will have the standard of care being a universal testing arm and the, uh, and the intervention being an enhanced universal testing arm that will include improved retention and, um, and different phases of this, um, this algorithm will be, will be looked at. So the, the project um, also has a number of other work packages um, that we'll be looking at social behavioral uh, component, a pediatric component, a health economics in order to, to look at cost effectiveness of universal testing and modeling to determine the impact of this on the community level. So I just want to acknowledge um, the investigator team and the trial steering committee, our funder, EPCTP, and all of the partners um, of the CUT-TB study. Thank you. Thank you, Salome, for, for a great presentation and also reminding us that part of the, the you know, when we talk about case finding, it's not only to find uh, people with disease, but uh, those that can also, you know, can be started on preventive treatment. Um, I will we'll now have a few questions that we will ask the presenters directly. I, I'll say maybe one each for each of the presenters. And um, I will basically focus on the questions that are still open in the chat. Uh, there is one question from um, uh, Dr. Villain, one, one of my, my co-chair, and I'll take advantage of giving him the opportunity to ask a question now before I, 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 I read what I have in the chat. Kavi? Thanks very much, Violet, and, and thanks to the opening speakers for, for that session. I think it's really highlighted the possibility for us to really be innovative in the approach to controlling TB uh, with the different designs and applications of diagnostics. My, my question is to Achilles, and it's really about this issue that we should be looking at TB care very holistic. And I think you made some of those in, you know, remarks in your uh, opening um, part for the presentation today, Violet, which is, you know, we can't just be thinking about the diagnosis, it all has to look, you know, as part of linkage to care and ensuring patients reach the end of that journey. So my question is to Achilles is, with the, um, you know, with the intervention that you proposed, you made a very concerted effort in making sure that it also strengthened the health system to cope with the new diagnosis and linkage to care that you then, you know, demonstrated. Um, what lessons can you provide us beyond the approach to understanding what was needed for the broader intervention um, that others who are you know, participating today on the webinar can learn from as far as how to engage with the national programs within their respective countries and how this element to you know, ensuring completion of care, but also that linkage part can be emphasized um, and not just the, the diagnostic angle improved. Yeah, it's quite a, a difficult one that in many of us probably in our academic institutions, probably we end up doing research without working closely with the programs. And so sometimes we come and introduce systems for research, which probably may not be sustainable within the program after you end the research. So over time, since 2007, when we started to do part of this work, we realized that we needed to engage the national program so that whatever we are going to do, it fits within what they are doing. At the same time, you make sure that, for example, the data collection in that process, we've never really introduced new data collection tools. We use the registers, the registers may not be well filled, but probably one of the things which is a responsibility of the program is to ensure that there is quality data so that for you, you can capture that data, but you need to look at the whole diagnostic cascade, not only saying the lab as the point, you have put a new tool, but the processes, there are many patients who come to the facility and go back without reaching the lab. So our initial work really looked at the fallout, really only 42% of the people. Many reach there, they never reach the lab. They reach the lab, definitely there are no cartilages, but even the results are done. 
because of the processes, TB is never something that is urgent. It is done in the next day or at the end of the day. So unless you work with the people in the lab to prioritize TB, given that the test is takes only one and a half hours or two at most, and maybe you organize the processes within the lab and work closely, and you fit within the staffing that is existing there. But otherwise, you introduce a new staff or two to do that. Probably we think that as new diagnostics come in, let's think of the processes where they are going to sit, the health systems per se, uh, and the work together closely. That's why probably they may have impact. Otherwise, as a tool, gene expert was everywhere, but you could see that even in the border border to at least operationalize this hub spoke model, if not doing well, then probably it's not going to work as much as you think you've covered that area. So I think the key issues here are to work closely with the program, understand the resources that are available. So work within the resources, not introduce more resources for the purposes of the study, if at all, it's going to impact service. Yeah, that's all. Thanks, thanks very much, Achilles. Uh, there is just one open question to the chat. Uh, and I would like to thank the presenters for responding to the questions uh, that were raised in the chat. The question that's open is for uh, Salome. Uh, Salome, um, there is a question from Cristela Juego. Uh, she's saying, I have question, I have concerns during this study. Uh, contacts we have any symptoms without cough? Is the team for seeing other sample collection techniques, um, swab others to improve both sensitivity or you know, as an alternative to sputum production. She's also just curious to know what will be the regimen for adult household contacts with negative TB investigation. Okay, thank you, Violet. Um, when it comes to sputum production, at the moment, we're not using any other techniques. We're only going to doing normal sputum, uh, you know, collection. Um, and we haven't yet looked at swabs or anything like that. But we can say that, uh, and as, as, as was shown um, with the study done in Clarkstall, that actually a large proportion of patients are able to give us sputum and we actually haven't had any difficulty of getting sputum in, in the, the, the patients that we've enrolled so far. Um, but we, we, we are looking at uh, you know, the quality of the sputum and with the enhanced, um, the enhanced uh, universal testing, we may be looking at ways to improve the quality. Um, and then with the preventive therapy, well, we're waiting for the new guidelines to come out and we are hoping that uh, the new guidelines will endorse uh, and we'll have uh, three HP as the preferred regimen for contact. Um, just to make it clear, we are actually testing all patients, not only those that are symptomatic, so even asymptomatic patients, and yet we are able to get sputum um, and currently looking at the quality of the sputum um, and, and we'll keep you posted on that. Thanks, Salome, for the response. We'll take one more, one last question for this session. And uh, there is a hand from um, Lang. Masipo, uh, can you facilitate uh, allowing her to speak? Okay, uh, sorry, I can't really see any hands. Um, Maybe if you can unmute yourself, Lang, and ask the question. This will be the last question for the session. Lang, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. <laughs> um, okay. Apologies, I think it was a mistake. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you very much, uh, but feel free to add your question in the chat. Uh, we love questions. Uh, I'll now yes. hand over to my co-chair, uh, Dr. Villan, to introduce our next uh, set of presenters. Over to you, Kavi. Thanks very much, Violet. Um, so we'll move swiftly along just to make sure we stay in time and, and provide sufficient uh, you know, time at the end of the program for questions and additional discussion. So the next uh, presenter on our lineup is Professor Peter McPherson. Uh, Professor McPherson is a public health physician and HIV-TB researcher based full-time in Malawi, 
where he leads the population health research team at the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Program. He's trained in medicine at the University of Aberdeen and holds a PhD from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. His research focus, um, on the uh, focuses on the development and evaluation of novel diagnostic, treatment and prevention interventions to accelerate elimination of HIV and TB transmission. Professor McPherson is a principal investigator on several large randomized trials for TB and HIV, and he holds an honorary position as a consultant in communicable disease control with the UK Health Security Agency and as a professor of population health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Peter, over to you. So thank you very much, Kavi, and it's really a pleasure to be speaking to you this evening. Um, very kind introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be presenting some data from Blantar in, in Malawi. So I thought I'd just start by giving a, a little bit of context. Um, so Blantar is located in, in the south uh, of Malawi, and it's really the, the main commercial center in, in Malawi with a home to about a million people or so. We have an extensive uh, surveillance system for both HIV and TB that we've established over the last decade or so. And so in urban Blantar district, about 10% uh, of, of adult men are HIV positive uh, and 16% of adult women are HIV positive. Our, in our most recent uh, TB prevalence survey that we conducted in 2019 and 20, uh, we found that the prevalence of adult uh, pulmonary TB to be 215 per 100,000. And this is actually quite a large decline uh, since the last, uh, since, over the last 10 years or so. And we see quite a lot of evidence that TB is beginning to concentrate in specific areas of the neighbourhoods. Good. So in, in this talk, I'm going to be talking about computer-aided diagnosis for TB and why it's needed. Uh, I'll run through some of the current platforms that are available and what the current uh, WHO recommendations for use are, uh, before going on to present some evidence for diagnostic accuracy, but I think also more importantly for effectiveness in, in clinical and public health practice. And I'm going to finish by, by giving some thoughts about where next for, for computer-aided diagnosis for TB. So just to introduce the topic, uh, what is computer-aided diagnosis for TB? Well, essentially, uh, we, we've used chest X-ray for, for decades, uh, nearly a century for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Uh, and we're now at the point where we have computer algorithms, essentially software packages uh, that have been trained on tens to hundreds of thousands of annotated chest X-rays. Uh, and by that, I mean, these are X-rays that have associated metadata, such as what was the, the patient's sputum smear or, or culture status or expert status, and what radiologists have classified those X-rays as. Now, those X-rays are fed into deep learning neural net algorithms, and, and essentially that provides a classification. Um, and, and so these are essentially machine learning uh, algorithms. And right now, the current software packages that are available produce three outputs, uh, potentially, depending on the package. The, the first output that all packages uh, produce is a probabilistic score for TB. Essentially, the, the software looks at the digital X-ray uh, and gives a score from 0 to 1 or 0 to 100 uh, for how likely uh, it thinks that, that X-ray shows evidence of, of microbiologically confirmed TB. Some software packages will additionally produce a, a text report, uh, and this is a, a more narrative uh, description of abnormalities on the X-ray. And additionally, some software packages will produce a heat map. So that's really a visual representation of where uh, the X-ray think, uh, the software thinks that there are abnormalities suspicious of TB on the chest X-ray. And so the WHO last year reviewed the evidence for computer-aided diagnosis of tuberculosis, and I think this is a really big step forward. Essentially, this is one of the first instances where we have a positive recommendation from the WHO for an artificial intelligence screening uh, and, and triage tool in medicine. And so WHO says computer-aided detection is recommended for the first time as an alternative to human interpretation of digital chest X-ray for screening and for triage. Uh, of course, this is currently limited to adults aged 15 years or over. There, there is a paucity of evidence for, for younger children. Very important to distinguish between these two use cases. 
So screening, where we're essentially di distinguishing people from you know, who have a high likelihood of having TB from those with a lower likelihood, and this is not diagnostic. Uh, and, and of course, the other use case that WHO recommends is in the triage testing situation, for example, in primary health centers or, or in clinics, where the software can assist with, 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 with determining subsequent diagnostic and care pathways for people that are accessing care and assessing various different differential diagnoses. So why is CAD needed? Well, I'm gonna talk through some of the main reasons here, and, and, and I think they're fourfold. The first reason is, is, is we really need a high throughput tool for screening and triage testing for tuberculosis. Secondly, the existing tools that we have are not really suitable for screening or for triage for TB. Uh, we have very good quality, accuracy, and effectiveness data now that support use in a wide variety of settings. And I believe there's also potential synergistic benefits uh, for universal healthcare, uh, especially within resource limited settings. So why do we need CAD? Well, this is data that has been collected in Blantar in Malawi by, by our PhD student in our group, Helena Fizi. And essentially she uh, recruited essentially every adult uh, coming through the door of a very busy primary healthcare center over a one year period, so nearly 12,000 adults. And, and what she found was that nearly half of those adults uh, reported any TB symptom, with 27% reporting cough of any duration, and 10% uh, reporting chronic cough of more than two weeks. And, you know, if we were to follow the guidelines for, for TB testing for these people, we would very quickly overwhelm the budget of the Malawian health system. And secondly, uh, we would not be able to, to fulfill this demand with the number of tests as it's possible to undertake in a primary healthcare system. And so how can CAD help? Well, CAD is much more sensitive than symptom screening for TB, and I'll show you show that in the next few slides. CAD is also makes it feasible to undertake large-scale screening for TB, the sort of screening that's needed in active case finding and triage. Essentially, it takes about a minute or so to do a chest x-ray and, and another minute or so for the software to give you the result of the algorithm. So you can do tens of thousands of x-rays per day. AI doesn't get tired, unlike radiologists, uh, who we know the quality of, of x-ray reads decreases throughout the day. Um, the, 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 the quality of the read stays the same throughout the whole period. We know that AI is consistent, but also that it can be changed easily one of the real benefits here is if we can set a threshold whereby we say, you know, if the score is over 80, then we would go ahead and do a sputum test. And, and we can vary that depending on the epidemiological characteristics of the population. Essentially, CAD is a trade-off between how much TB are you willing to miss and how much money uh, can you afford on complementary sputum testing. Right now, many places, and especially rural areas in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia, we don't have access to qualified human uh, radiologists or doctors able to read x-rays. So, so CAD is really a replacement here. And many radiologists, particularly in the private sector, don't want to read chest x-rays. You know, it does, doesn't really pay very well. So I wanted to, to give a quick overview of the accuracy evidence for CAD uh, algorithms. And, and this table is taken from last year's WHO TB screening guidelines, where they reviewed uh, the evidence for accuracy. Uh, and what you can really take away for both the screening and triage use case is that uh, CAD algorithms are currently as accurate or perhaps even more accurate than expert human readers. Now, of course, there's quite a bit of nuance in here. So Andrew Codlin and, and colleagues in Vietnam undertook a, a very nice study among people attending primary care uh, and, and looked at the performance of different software packages. Here you can see they, they've evaluated 13 different packages in this study. Uh, and I think the key point to take away here is that there's quite a lot of variability. So currently these three software packages would have met uh, the WHO uh, performance uh, characteristics, whereas other software packages are still in much early development phases. So accuracy is great, but I'm a public health physician, and I believe that what's really important for patients and for health systems is thinking about effectiveness. Um, so does CAD improve patient important outcomes? And by that, I mean diagnostic yield. Can we diagnose more people? Can we result in more confirmed diagnosis? Can we reduce the time it takes to get people initiated onto treatment for tuberculosis? Can we reduce morbidity and mortality? And of course, can we reduce the catastrophic household costs that are really strongly associated with care seeking for TB. So 
to, to investigate this question, we conducted a, a study in Blantar in Malawi called the Prospect Study. Uh, and, and this was a study conducted in primary care where we uh, recruited adults, that's people aged 18 years or older, with cough of any duration who was attending the, the primary healthcare center um, with, with symptoms of TB. Uh, and, and we set out to recruit nearly 1,500 uh, adults. These individuals were individually randomized into one of three arms in the clinic. In the first arm, the standard of care arm, uh, they were asked to wait in the queue in the clinic uh, to be assessed by a clinical officer or a nurse. Available in the clinic was gene expert, sputum smear, and HIV testing uh, and treatment for TB and HIV as well. That's the standard of care. In the second arm, we randomized uh, individuals to receive HIV screening using a self-testing oral test approach that we previously found to be very successful in Lantar. And we supported linkage into HIV treatment for people uh, who were newly diagnosed or, 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 or had uh, dropped out of treatment. Uh, and the rationale behind this approach was that by linking people into HIV treatment earlier, we might prompt a more thorough investigation for TB or even unmask TB as part of the RT initiation. In the third arm, uh, participants received the HIV testing intervention, but additionally received a TB screening intervention. And that was digital chest X-ray interpreted by the CAD for TB version five software. And we set a threshold based uh, on 45 or greater, so that if individuals score was greater than or equal to 45, we, we collect the sputum for, for, for gene expert testing on, on the same day in the clinic. So this is essentially a triage testing approach uh, for tuberculosis. You can see full details of the protocol by, by, by clicking on the, the QR code there with your phone. We followed up all the individuals recruited to this trial for, for eight weeks. Um, and our primary trial outcome was time to TB treatment initiation. We also collect the sputum from all individuals, uh, regardless of arm, at day 56. to the three interventions too. And so this is the sort of setting in which the study was conducted. Essentially, we had a, an outfitted a container clinic with a radiology suite, and we used um, fingerprint biometrics to make sure we, we minimize contamination between trial arms. So this table shows the baseline characteristics of participants in the study. The main thing to note is that characteristics across the three arms were well balanced. I also really want to highlight uh, the, the HIV-related data in this population, and we'll see that approximately 19% of adults recruited to the trial reported themselves to be HIV-positive at recruitment, but coverage of antiretroviral therapy was extremely high, and this is a real testament to the Malawi HIV treatment program, and, and this is backed up with many other studies that we've, we've conducted in, in Blantar. So this Kaplan Meyer plot summarizes the primary outcome of the trial, that is time from recruitment to TB treatment initiation. And so you can see in the blue uh, curve here, which is a HIV and TB screening arm, we significantly and substantially increased uh, the time to TB treatment initiation and also uh, the yield of TB diagnosis compared to uh, the HIV screening arm. Arm and just a little bit more, more detail. Here in the columns, we have the three trial arms uh, outcomes and the comparison in the last uh, column between the, the HIV and TB screening arm and the standard of care arm. So overall, uh, in the standard of care arm, by day 56, we had diagnosed uh, five individuals had, had initiated TB treatment uh, in the standard of care arm compared to 15 uh, in the HIV and TB screening arm. Uh, and, and we substantially and significantly reduced the time to TB treatment initiation from a median of 11 days in the standard of care arm down to one day in the HIV and TB screening arm. So that gave a hazard ratio of 2.5 to 1. TB treatment on the same day. And you will see in the standard of care arm, essentially no individuals uh, achieve same day diagnosis and treatment of TB. Whereas in the HIV and TB screening arm, six out of the 15 diagnosed people with, with TB had that same day initiation uh, of TB treatment. At day 56, uh, we collected sputum for culture and expert from all participants. We did not find any significant difference in the rate of undiagnosed TB between arms, although numbers were very small because of the low prevalence in this comparison. And likewise, there was no difference in mortality uh, between arms. 
I'm not going to go into in great detail because this is a TB focused talk, but even despite the very high coverage of antiretroviral therapy for HIV in Blantar, we had a, an extremely large and significant reduction in undiagnosed uh, HIV uh, with both uh, the HIV screening and the TB HIV screening arms. This table presents the cost effectiveness um, analysis uh, from the within trial um, analysis. And so to read this trial, we're looking along, uh, to read this table, we're looking along rows for each arm, so standard of care arm, HIV screening arm, and HIV anti-TB screening arm in the bottom row. And you can see the total mean cost per participant of the interventions delivered in each arm of the trial. So the, the HIV and TB screening arm was approximately double uh, the cost per participant um, of the standard of care arm. Um, so an extra $20 uh, effectively per participant. This um, column here shows the, the, the qualities uh, gained from on average from each participant across arms. And we can see that even over this short period, we had substantial gains in qualities for both the HIV screening and the HIV and TB screening arms. One really important thing to note um, is that Malawi does not have a cost effectiveness threshold um, defined. So we uh, looked at the probability that these interventions would be cost effective uh, at three different thresholds, at a at 400 uh, US dollar per quality threshold, an $800 and a, a, a $1,200 uh, per quality threshold. Uh, and whereas the, 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 the HIV testing intervention was likely to be highly cost effective over this period, the, the HIV and TB screening intervention was not. So just Peter, to see these results. Just, sorry, if I can interject. Sorry, Peter, if I could just ask you to conclude the presentation just to the for the interest of time. Sure, of course. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Kavi. Yeah. So this just to conclude, these results are now published uh, a few months ago. You can read about them in this publication. And just to say there's a few ongoing randomized trials that I won't go into a lot of detail. The main one is, is this trial that will report imminently. And so just to conclude by saying CAD is here, and especially in low and middle income countries, we think there is big potential for improving TB care and prevention, and also potential for other diseases as well. These algorithms are improving extremely rapidly, uh, and WHO is currently undertaking the pre-qualification -quali pre process, for, uh, which is the first time software will be used as a medical device. The key priorities now, I think, are that we need to have clinical and diagnostic pathways for people with a high CAD score, but negative sputum, and this is extremely common. We need adaptive thresholds varied by different population characteristics, age, sex, previous TV, and for different resources. We don't really know how to do this yet. We need to reduce the cost of software and improve ease of use and, and support for, for low resource settings. And we need better regulation to improve the rollout of digital chest X-ray and CAD software throughout the world. So thank you very much. Apologies for running over slightly. And yeah, it's been a pleasure to speak to CAD uh, about this. Thanks very much, Peter. And um, I think there's lots to be said about uh, the resuscitation of chest x-rays in this space for TB and the use of, of CAD. Um, I think you touched your very last point around regulation, I think is an important factor for all of us sitting and listening in on this, um, which is how do we try and implement such technology in, in our settings? Um, what are the barriers and how can we overcome some of those? I think what's important as a takeaway from the presentation is that you know, there's been the global guidance from the WHO around the utility, you know, utility of test X-ray and CAD. And I think you know, programs must not be intimidated by the prospect of having to go from zero to hero, in other words, implementing chest X-rays broadly, but that this should be a staged process and um, you know, hopefully realize targeted uh, use of X-rays initially um, for a long-term gain in, in expanding its use. Um, so yeah, just an important takeaway point there. So we'll move very quickly um, in the interest of time to our next speaker, um, which is um, Dr. Morten Ruvald, who's the uh, director for the TB program at FIND. And he will present on um, the new diagnostics pipeline uh, for, for TB. Dr. Ruvald is a medical doctor with a PhD from Copenhagen University. Uh, with over 15 years of professional experience, including 12 in research and development in the area of vaccines and diagnostics for TB. Dr. Ruvalt has been the project lead on several diagnostic tests for latent MTB infection, including specific skin tests and new simpler in vitro diagnostics in the IGRA family. 
Prior to joining FIND, Dr. Ruvolt was the Chief Medical Officer and the Head of, of Human Immunology at the Center for Vaccine Research at Staten Serum Institute. Morton, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kavi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. And can you see my screen? Perfect. Great, thank you very much. A lot has been said uh, already, and uh, yeah, I see my introduction is kind of um, capturing a little bit of the, the sentiment from, um, from, um, from Leslie earlier. But I think it is important to just remind ourselves that uh, Every year we have a, a, a detection gap of about 4.2 million uh, people. That was the number in the recent WHO report. We only have about a third of the global TB population that are bacteriologically confirmed. Only about 20% are diagnosed with the WHO recommended molecular diagnostic and only one out of three with drug resistant TB are tested and put on relevant uh, treatment. COVID has been uh, detrimental to, to, to TB programs across the world. And, you know, these are just a couple of the curves from the WHO report sort of um, estimating the, the mortality and the incidence uh, over the next uh, five years. We will see both of these being ramped up. And as, as Leslie uh, rightfully um, mentioned, uh, you know, this is the first time we are seeing a, an increase in, in, in mortality. Um, in the past decade. Testing remains the weakest link in the cascade of care, and we must urgently address it to support the global uh, recovery. And as many have mentioned uh, in today's uh, session, the diagnostic gaps have many causes, the tools are not fit for purpose, the patient initiate care at the, in the community or at the PhD level where there is no real capacity to diagnose TB. If we rely too much on, on symptoms, we will only get the cases that are perhaps in with, with more advanced disease. Uh, so we're missing a lot of, of the patients that are out there. And by relying on, on But I'm quite positive as well, uh, not because of the effect of the pandemic on, on TB in general, but, but the effect of the pandemic on, on, on the new opportunities. Um, just taking a couple of the points that, that Leslie uh, brought up. I think the diagnostics have been brought much closer to the patients. Um, we have a much more diverse portfolio. It is probably the end of the one size fits all in, in TB. We have a lot of opportunity to leverage the investment in diagnostic infrastructure and digital connectivity. We also have new tools for, for TB infection uh, that, that we, uh, we probably also should, should add as part of a more comprehensive strategy. We have a lot of work um, ahead of us to, 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 to capture the lost ground after COVID. We need the new tools. So, Beautifully presented by Achilles earlier today, I think it makes uh, a lot of sense to, um, to do uh, better sort of streamlined work, the on-site molecular detection and streamlined workflows uh, is the way to go. And um, the Cepheid um, system uh, is probably um, one of the better we have for this approach at the moment, but, but clearly it is it's too complicated and, and difficult to run. Um, and in the clinic, you know, this, we, we, we have the opportunity to use tools like this, but when we get into the communities, the prevalence will be lower, there will probably be less sputum production among the TB cases, they will have more subclinical TB and at least uncharacteristic symptoms, and it gets into this active case finding screening situation where perhaps also the, the the, the interest from the uh, from the patient to to actually go on a really complicated uh, treatment like TB is is a difficult sell. So there are a lot a lot of barriers that we need to uh, to address, and it's it isn't solved by technology alone. Um, but this is a pipeline presentation, so I'll just give a, a couple of, uh, of of slides on on where we are at the moment and where we are we are going. 
Um, so we have the Cepheid system, we have uh, the, the single cartridge uh, edge all the way up to the big infinity systems um, for ultra. And then we, we also have the new MTB XDR cartridge uh, that, that has to run on uh, the, the 10 color instrument. And here you get INH, fluoroquinolone, and second line injectables as sort of a reflex test after the, the ultra. Molbio is, uh, is the other WHO uh, endorsed um, tool. It's, um, it's, um, it's a two unit uh, product that has a, a sample prep uh, station here and then the, the PCI unit that, that takes these individual chips. And each uh, chip does um, TB, another chip would do uh, RIF. Another chip would in the future be doing INH. Then there's one for fluoroquinolones. They're working on a bit acronym one. They have one called the TB Ultima, which is uh, using these um, uh, multi uh, insertion targets like I6110. Uh, that is, is an attempt to, to, to reach the, the sensitivity of the ultra. And then they do also have a, a test uh, that combines TB and, and COVID. The challenge is there to get everything on one sample, and, and we are quite hopeful that, that this could be done with, um, with a tone swap. Um, the fast followers are the SD Biosensor Standard M10. It's a new platform. It looks, uh, the, the cartridge looks fairly similar to what we are familiar with with, uh, with Expert. Uh, the, the instrument is different. It's a control unit, and there's these eight, up to eight random access uh, modules, and you can run multiple assays at the same time. Um, it, uh, the TB assay uh, will be able to detect uh, TB, RIF, and INH up front. Um, and the res time to result is about 60 minutes. Um, and uh, it will hopefully go through policy review in 2023. A little bit earlier uh, would be the, the Bioneer INQ PCR. Um, it's, it's also a, um, a PCR instrument that has a cartridge very similar to this one. It can do up to 48 targets, so it's a really versatile instrument. Um, and the TB assay there is TB detection, RIF, INH, fluoroquinolones, and second line injectables um, at the initial uh, sample. So, so clearly that, that, that is a very broad um, test and, and much more easy. It would be much more easy to, to implement than the current Cepheid system that is a, a detection and a reflex test. Um, right. Uh, but we, we need something simpler, and um, I will build on sort of Leslie's uh, pitch uh, on, on the, the wonders of, of, of Tom Swap by, um, by introducing this, the, uh, the Lumira DX, which is uh, probably the first uh, purely um, swap-based TB detection assay that's being proposed. So it's a new unit. It's about the size of, uh, of a brick. Um, the platform itself was launched back in 2018, and there's about 5,000 instruments in use on the African continent now. Uh, the TBSA will take a swap, a relatively simple uh, sample prep, and then uh, you insert a little uh, chip here into the, to the instrument, and then it will do a very rapid amplification in about 15 minutes. So they claim to have a test time of about 20 minutes from, from sample. Um, so potentially truly disruptive and really something uh, Achilles and, and the others would, would be, um, be able to put into their uh, setup in Uganda to, to, to see, okay, how, how close to the patient can we actually go with, uh, with these kind of technologies. Um, we'll be entering clinical trial uh, on this for, for policy um, early in 2023. Uh, but they're not alone. Uh, this is just an attempt to, to really capture a, a complex uh, technology landscape uh, that we have looked at for, for, for COVID-19. Uh, so we are aware of around 150 manufacturers who are developing near point of care or true point of care tests. Um, around 20, 30 of these are, are really true point of care. Some of these are even single-use disposable PCR instruments. Um, they are all developed for COVID, uh, and they are now uh, having perhaps difficulty finding a market in a, in, with, 
with a lot of competition and and I think we as a community, the TV community, really need to to incentivize these people to or these companies to to take on a high volume, uh, perhaps low cost but high volume a market like um, like TV. So you can see these are some of the uh, the examples here. This one is a single uh, use uh, PCR instrument. It's probably not very good for the environment, but um, uh, but you can see stuff like this is uh, the service agreements and all of the other challenges that that are with the current install base would be completely different with uh, with these kind of technologies. Um, so we're not there yet uh, on TB, but but definitely taking a, a swab and replacing some primers and probes uh, is is clearly different from from developing a, a sputum based assay that that has a lot of challenges. Um, so hopefully we will see many of these coming out with TB assays in the future. Um, I think we also uh, need to look at other sample types uh, than, than swaps. And um, we are very interested in bioaerosols uh, at the moment. TB is uh, transmitting with aerosols that are produced in the, the deep lung of the, the patient. And you have to inhale these and actually get them down into the uh, alveolar macrophages for to make the infection. And so clearly they are there from the patients and they are there for the picking. So two approaches uh, that is being um, done here is either with uh, something like face masks, where you uh, you put on a face mask and then inside here, there'll be a, a small strip that would uh, then detect these uh, tiny aerosols or droplets. And you can then take the strip out, put it in water and run it on a, on a gene expert system. Others are using filters inside a, a blow tube, uh, illustrated here with a toilet roll and a coffee filter, but um, that's the principle. And there here you have to elute the, uh, the captured box uh, somehow like in this, well, something <laughs> a little bit smaller than a coffee filter. But again, it's the same kind of approach. Uh, and the back end could be the cephate, it could be uh, any of the, uh, of the molecular assays recommended for, for, for TB. So um, there's a really nice paper from Caroline Williams and the team at, uh, at Leicester, published in Lancet Respir uh, Respiratory Medicine uh, a couple of years back. And here they, uh, they looked at uh, this for, for several different uh, use cases. And I've, I've pulled together some data from that uh, paper. And here, uh, when they compare sputum against mask, it seems the sensitivity is, is quite on par. And there is some discordance here that potentially could be used to, uh, to improve uh, the diagnostic sensitivity overall. Then the, um, when you look at the, the bacterial load here in the masks, that's the green compared to sputum uh, from these are two patients where they've taken samples over 24 hours, every three hours, you can see it's easy to get a, a face mask. It seems the, the levels are quite consistent, but they are indeed lower than what you would see with the, with the sputum samples, suggesting that you might not get exactly the same um, LOD as you could get from, from a sputum sample, but it, you would get it every time you put a face mask on. It's not every time a patient can produce a quality sputum sample. Um, Biosols is, is also potentially a tool for transmission and there's this nice study, it's still in, in preprint um, and not peer reviewed, but they took 46 newly diagnosed TB patients in the Gambia and they put a face mask on them. And then they said, are they high aerosolizers or low aerosolizers? And they split them up in two groups. And then they looked at 181 household contacts. They tested for TB infection with quantiferin at baseline and then followed up after two years. Uh, sorry, after six months uh, for quantiferin conversion as sort of a measure of, of infectiousness. And then they looked at various uh, types of, of measures for, for infectiousness, like the face mask, um, uh, air, bacterial load, uh, sputum AFB, sleeping proximity, chest x-ray, etc. And, and a little bit surprisingly, classic measures like uh, sleeping proximity did not um, predict infectivity, but, but the face mask uh, clearly, or bio, so it's clearly um, was able to predict uh, the, um, the number of, of household contacts who, who had uh, a quantiferin conversion. So with these tools, we, we might be entering a field where, where sensitivity, the high sensitivity, and the challenges with the with the difficult sample from the cephates 
often student-based tools, um, needs to be weighed up against something that might be slightly less sensitive, but a much easier sample to, to obtain, and therefore a higher diagnostic yield. And potentially we are capturing those that from a public health point of view, might be a more relevant population to diagnose uh, those that are transmitting the bacteria in, in the population. So this is something we, we, we're trying to sort of get our head around. How do you actually do accuracy trialings uh, with these kind of, of parameters? Um, I'd like to just, mention... Sorry, if I can just ask you to move to the conclusion in the interest of time. Thank you. Right. Great. Yeah, I'll highlight that there are high throughput systems as well. We need to use these much more. We have LAM assays that are coming through the pipeline, ultra-sensitive uh, third-generation LAM assays that are using new improved reagents, new sample prep, and innovative assay design, and we can do much better than ALEA and the Fuji LAM. Chest X-rays, I do not need to mention them. Uh, it's beautifully captured by, by Peter earlier. Uh, I would just mention here that we also have other digital tools like point of care ultrasound digitally or AI enabled digital stethoscopes and, and, and a really interesting field around cough apps where you would cough into your smartphone and then the, the, the AI could then determine what type of cough it is and some of these even claim to be simple spirometers. The take home messages are that we critically need to invest in, in TB now, and that's also the theme of the World TB Day. We need to really be creative around triage and screening approaches. Diagnostics doesn't, uh, the technologies doesn't do it at all. Um, and we need to bring the diagnostics closer to the patients. We need to break down the silos and multi pathogenize the molecular diagnostic services. Thank you. Thanks very much, Morten, and sorry for, for cutting short your presentation. I'm sure this is usually something that requires much more time, and it's very exciting to see all the developments. Um, at times, it, it feels like something out of a sci-fi movie, but perhaps that's a, a great way to think about uh, how innovation is, is changing the TV space. Um, I think during the Q&A session, I would be very interested to understand you know, what happens in the back end here and what efforts are happening to accelerate the introduction of these tests, uh, but perhaps you can ponder on that before the Q&A starts. Okay, so we'll move to the last of our um, formal presenters. Um, the next presenter really is um, representing an important aspect within the TB community, um, you know, which is our uh, community and civil society and the importance of engaging uh, with those entities you know, in order for us to maximize our, our efforts towards delivering patient-centered care. And I'd like to introduce um, Chipo Maware, who is currently employed by the Jointed Hands Welfare Organization as a strategic information manager. She holds a Master of Science degree in Biostatistics and Epidemiology from the Midland State University and has 18 years of community work experience, specifically on health promotion. Over to you, Chipo. Thank you. Uh, greetings to everyone. I don't know whether I am audible enough. Yeah, we can hear you fine, Chipo. Okay. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my presentation is on community TB contribution community contribution in TB active case finding. So in terms of the presentation outline, I will focus on giving an overview of who Joint Enhanced Welfare Organization is, the TB project that we are implementing. I also give an, over, uh, on, of, an overview on that. I also uh, share innovations that we've done when we are doing, uh, that we've done in the um, community, implementing the community aspect of the project. Uh, also share how the community has contributed uh, in active case finding. So to begin with, Joined Hands Welfare Organization is a private voluntary organization that was registered in 2013 to operate in Zimbabwe. And we are in almost all the 10 provinces of Zimbabwe implementing at least a project. We envision a harm and disease society and our mission is to advocate against harmful norms and mitigating the impact thereof. 
We are guided by strategic pillars of focus, which include health, social development, resilience strengthening, disaster risk management, strategic information and knowledge management. So the project that we are implementing falls under the health strategic pillar. And this project is the TB uh, Local Organizations Network grant and it started in 2019 and it's ending on the 30th of September in uh, 2024. It's being implemented through a group of uh, organizations that are local. The, the consortium of four partners that joined hands, uh, WASPAS, Bain's Occupational Services, and our prime, the lead organization is Union Zimbabwe Trust. So in the consortium, joined hands is responsible for implementing the community related uh, TB interventions. Um, so we started uh, in 2020 with four districts, that's Gweru, Incisa, Gwanda, and Sushavani. We then had additional districts being robbed in, in 2021, that's Churumanzu, Shurugui, and Mwenezi, and Kwekwe. So in terms of the innovations that we have implemented as a community partner in this project, we have worked with district stakeholders so that we get their buy-in and support in terms of uh, demand generation. So we sensitized 240 district stakeholders in the eight districts. And in the photo there, you are seeing one of the district sensitization meetings that we did with stakeholders from Gweru district. The second innovation that we did knowing that we need to get buy-in from the community leaders themselves because they are influential gatekeepers when it comes to community programs was the community dialogue sessions that we held with 3,745 influential community leaders. This was meant to create a demand for TB services from the community because we know community leaders are always having community meetings with community members. So if they know about TB, they can always put in a word. So in the photo, there is a, one of the community dialogue sessions that was held in, in Caesar district. We also empowered health center committees because they've got an oversight role that they give um, in the health facilities that they are working with. So we empowered 587 health center committee chairpersons from the eight districts. These health center committee chairpersons then cascaded the trainings to 1,818 health center members. The plan um, was to ensure that if there are any advocacy issues that have to be cascaded to the health facilities or that have to be cascaded to the district health team, this committee would be so empowered to cascade the issues. Then the other innovation that we did was to work with the health facility nurses whom we trained uh, as the train of trainers after they were trained as trainer of trainers, they then went on to form clusters at their health facilities and cascaded the training to community-based cadres. So in the photo there, you can see there is a Kwekwe district uh, community cadre training, which was done by the local nurses. In the photo, they are being taught on how to complete community TB registers. And in the second photo, we also see that the community cadres, after they were trained, we supported them with visibility material, the hats, the masks, the t-shirts, as well as the bags. Besides that, we also supported with uh, stipends. So at the end of the month, after they've done screenings, after they've presumed clients and they've referred the clients to the uh, local health facility, and we verified that in the health facility, the client has been recorded as coming from community or referred by community they would then be given those stipends. So in this innovation, as I said before, our facility nurses were trained and they in turn trained 967 community-based volunteers on TB active case finding in clusters at health facility. So each of the eight districts had one, an average of 120 community-based volunteers being trained in the district. But each health facility will be having at least three community cadres working with the health facility. So it's another photo of Kwekwe District. Uh, this was a training for the community-based cadres that was done in Kwekwe District. So the question is, after all these um, interventions, 
how has the community contributed in TB active case finding? The community has contributed to the increased number of clients being screened and presumed at community level. This is the DHIS2 data for the period 2020 to 2021 for Gweru district and Shishawani. These two districts are the one of the four districts that we started with in 2020. So the blue bar is the data for 2019. We had not yet started. The, from the orange bar, we now have an increase in the number of uh, community members that are being screened by community-based cadres. There is a sharp increase in 2021. This is for Gweru. And in terms of the presumed cases, these are the cases that were referred by community cadres to the health facility. In 2019, there were only 367, and there was a sharp increase in 2020 and 2021, which we can attribute to the presence of trained cadres who were now active in the community. The trend, the positive trajectory, is the trend for Shishawane, as well as um, if you look at the number of clients notified through community cadres for the same period, you will notice that uh, the first group of bars is about the TB notifications for the district blue 2019, orange 2020, and um, a gray 2021. But I want to draw your attention to the community contribution bars. There is a steady increase in the number of uh, notified cases that are coming from community. And if we look at the percentage contribution, in 2019, it was 5%. However, when we started the KNTB project, it rose to 13%, and it also increased to 17% in Gweru. Um, this is the community contribution, which we can say after presuming and referring the client to the health facility, these clients were notified through community. The national um, contribution for the national target for community contribution is 15%. So for Gweru, it, had, it surpassed the 15% mark in 2021. And for Sushalane, they surpassed the 15% mark in 2020 as well as 2023. So the other two districts that we had in the first year, that's 2020, is Gwanda and in Caesar. So you can also see it's the same trend. There is increased number of clients being screened and increased number of clients being notified. And as you can see, in 2021, Gwanda surpassed the 15% mark. And in 2020, as well as 2021, in Caesar surpassed the 15% mark. So we're saying this is the contribution that the comment uh, cadres have done when we're looking at um, TB data in DHIS2. We had additional districts in 2021. That's Mwenezi, Chirumanzi, Shurugu, and Kwekwe. So I will draw your attention to the green bars. The green bar is the community contribution. In 2019, uh, 2020, we were not there, but there is a sharp increase in 2021 when we started implementing in uh, Mwenezi. There is also a sharp increase in Chirumanzi from 7 to 33 when we started implementing in 2021. The trend is the same for Shurugu. However, there is a difference in Kwekwe because Kwekwe only started implementing towards the end of 2021, that is in December. So we can say this is the contribution. Besides um, screening and resume, community cadres are also doing community DOT as seen in the picture there. They're also doing health education and screening as seen in the second uh, photo. So in conclusion, we are saying together we can end TB. Let's invest in community cadres so that we end TB and save lives. This is a photo from when Mvuma district, which is Shurumanzi, of the community cadres that have got their reporting tools and they've come to the health facility to follow up on whether the clients that they've referred have reached the health facility. Thank you very much for attending this session. I hope we we'll invest in community cadres so that we end TB and safe lives. Over.
Thank you very much, uh, Chipo. I think um, that was a very important presentation, I think, for all of us to, to listen in on um, and really emphasizes the need for us to really rethink about the models of care and how we are able to reach patients in the community um, you know, in a, in, a, in a more sort of strengthened fashion to ensure that we don't leave anybody behind. Um, so I'm going to very speedily move into our next session because I'm cognizant of time and I would like to request for those that have hands up, if you can just put any questions that you have into the Q&A and that way we can make, make sure we don't miss out on responding to any of your uh, urgent questions. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panel, um, which today consists of um, Dr. Lindiwe Mvusi and Dr. Tuang Nguyen. Um, Dr. Mvusi um, is uh, director at the TB program in South Africa, and has spent many years uh, in the TB program uh, and been involved in many initiatives, um, you know, that have spearheaded our efforts for TB control in South Africa. And um, you know, my specific question uh, to Dr. Mvusi is really to give us some guidance and share some of her experience on how the program has really adopted um, many of the strategies, which I think from the outside um, have been viewed as very innovative uh, and accelerated um, the introduction of, in, in particular, the, the rollout of Gene Expert. And perhaps you can share a few thoughts on you know, how other programs might be able to learn from uh, the way that information and evidence is transformed and uh, you know, specifically engaged with uh, for policy implementation. So over to you, Dr. Bosi. Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I will sort of give my uh, response in regarding uh, the rollout of, um, of the expect uh, tests. And I think in that instance, I must put it up front that um, we, we didn't have the budget to actually roll out, but there was commitment to do that. And we had uh, great support from the NHLS, which is the service provider for the testing in terms of assisting around placement of, of the tests uh, in, in the laboratories. And uh, so our role really was to look at how we mobilize funding for that. Secondly, we needed to have an algorithm uh, uh, ready and in place for implementation, which was not an easy task. Uh, but uh, the algorithm that we had come up with was basically as a start to pilot it and improve over time. And um, obviously the next step was to also get uh, the SOPs from the laboratory side and the training uh, program for the users, uh, the nurses and the doctors in facilities. And that also required some resources. Uh, what we then did was uh, to, to mobilize resources to, to fund the procurement of the chest of the gene expert and, and then to also procure the, the cartridges. And the aim was to decentralize the, the expert testing to near the laboratories nearest to facilities. And I must say here initially when uh, this was introduced, we thought it would be a point of care test. And over time, it became clear that it will not work that way and there needed to be laboratory oversight uh, in terms of its implementation and have a quality control uh, system in place, monitoring of the functionality of the, of the tests uh, wherever they are placed. Um, but, uh, I must say we're lucky that uh, all that was, was actually done and, uh, and delivered within a short space of time, within six months. And we were ready to then uh, procure um, after we had mobilized resources and most of the funding agencies and partners that we have locally supported that process from Global Fund to USAID to PEFPA. And, and we're able then to procure as many um, uh, gene experts as we needed based on the volumes or, uh, in the laboratories. And um, the last part in terms of the rollout was then, uh, because the perception or the, the communication that went out initially 
especially from our political leaders was that this is a test that would be made available in every clinic and people will know the results and soon and start on treatment, which ended up not being the case. And we had to then manage that communication um, at a community level because there was already there were already people who were raising complaints that they went to a clinic and just did not access the test within the time frame, the results within the time frames. Um, and it's been a learning process, I must say, uh, during the implementation when we had to then uh, review and revise the way uh, our plans as we moved along. Um, and I must also indicate that um, there was a bit of uh, reluctance uh, to adopt the tests from some of the clinicians uh, who were still using cultures and some uh, using smear microscopy. So that took quite a period, I would say about two years to, to actually change the, the practice in most of our facilities. And uh, the other thing that we also needed to consider as we moved along because then the original gene cartridges were phased out for the gene expect ultra. And unfortunately, I think the challenge was that when that change over uh, to gene expect uh, ultra, we did not have a, a sufficient time to actually prepare facilities. So there was a lot of, uh, of, of confusion with, with that and the changes in the algorithm. So I think uh, for, for um, countries, it's, it's actually better to work out the planning for, for the introduction of any new diagnostic and uh, make sure that the algorithms are, are in place, training, and, uh, as well as mentoring and support to the facilities as they implement. Uh, again, when you look at the quality of the tests, we, we need to make sure that uh, there's quality assurance programs because quite a number of challenges uh, uh, would happen if that is not the case. For example, in terms of putting uh, people on treatment when they do not have uh, TB. The other experience which I might link to this would be the urine lamp, for example, which ties it nicely with in terms of preparation, um, which was not done as effectively but um, uh, it, it, it ended up over two years, uh, at least gaining momentum, but we had to also create a demand from the PLHIV sector so that uh, they understand how this test work and why not everyone would actually get the test and, and only a certain group of people would do that. So those uh, basically would be my uh, inputs to, to this and um, what is interesting as well uh, on the expert now is the use on stool, which is going to actually assist a lot in terms of uh, children now, diagnosis in children, because that has been an ongoing challenge uh, with facilities not being able to collect sputum, do gastric lavages, or uncomfortable with doing gastric lavages, uh, which is why we didn't really utilize the gene expect that much for children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vusi. And I think those uh, points that you raised are very important. And it's also a good segue to our next speaker. I think um, one of the main takeaway points to highlight here is that although there's a lot in the ecosystem that happens in the background um, from a new diagnostic being evaluated um, to the guidance being given by agencies like the WHO, it's equally important for countries to initiate and spearhead their own operational or implementational research that hopefully will help to guide the implementation process in country. And I think um, the South African TB program has really benefited from a lot of that kind of research. And similarly, I'm gonna hand now to uh, Dr. Tuan Nguyen, who is the country director for the Wilcock Institute, uh, a research NGO based in Vietnam, and um, has had a lot of success in driving um, one, you know, one could say the, the most appropriate research that aligns with the national TB program, uh, which has maximized the uptake of uh, the relevant research that they've performed. And I thought it would be very interesting to hear some of your perspective on uh, how have you been able to do this and lessons that uh, other listeners uh, or participants today might derive um, to be able to do some of the same in their own country. 
Over to you, Tuan. Thank you, Kami, and good evening from Vietnam. Uh, this is my honor to attend this webinar, and from my experience, uh, to scale up the of the intervention that we tested in the field, it requires a very good partnership with the national TB program. So before we conduct any um, intervention or uh, conduct any research in Vietnam, we have we spend a long time having a discussion with the national TB program leaders uh, to develop a shared vision and value and a shared goal. Uh, once we agree with that, then we can go, we can address a lot of challenges during the implementation. As a research institute, our work is to generate evidence um, to prove that uh, to have the NTP to uh, select the uh, most appropriate, most effective approach to reach the goal, which is NTP, as we all know. It's not easy to, to generate evidence because it requires high quality work. And we know that we have, especially in Vietnam, there's shortage of um, human capacity uh, to conduct research uh, activities. So we leverage strength between our team and the national TB program to achieve the goal. And uh, secondly, uh, very important is to gain trust from the NTP by uh, developing an equal partnership uh, between two, two parties. And we respect and we include the NTP uh, leaders and staff in all the discussion and uh, generating the evidence and support each other. And the thirdly, very important is uh, we do not stop when the research completed. We have the NTP to, um, we assist them to um, advocate for the approach that has uh, been proved to be effective. And we have the NTP to um, having a dialogue, a discussion with potential donors or even the government to leverage funding. And the approach have, uh, been proved to be effective for many years, and we have a very long term plan to work with the NTP in the coming years. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tuang. And I think uh, the sentiment between your response and Dr. Mbusi's is really that as a TB community, we all need to come together. Uh, we all have a role to play, um, whether we are on the end of funders, uh, research academics, uh, you know, all the different um, stakeholders that support the TB control efforts. And I think aligning on priorities, on approaches is really important if we want to maximize the impact of our efforts in our various programs. Um, Violet, I'd like to maybe um, ask if our, you know, our presenters could all maybe switch their cameras on. Um, and if we, there's perhaps time to entertain a few more questions from the floor um, before we conclude today's session. I'll hand over to you now, Violet. Thank you, Kavli. Um, I'm just checking now. I think we have a few open questions and I think it will be good just to take two minutes to try and uh, answer one or two questions. Um, there is a question from Richard Jenga, and he's, um, he wanted uh, Peter to comment on the introduction of low complexity automated nucleic acid tests and what is being done to roll out the use of this. Maybe it's a question for, for Morten. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's a question for Morten, yeah. Yeah, Morten. Did you get the question or should I repeat? No, I got the, uh, I got the question. Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so what the, the WHO have, have reviewed uh, the, the, uh, the CEPHAID system and the mobile system um, and are then trying to prepare themselves for review of, uh, of the um, the SD biosensor, for instance, that, that I showed. Um, so, I think the policy work is is very important for for the national TB programs to 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 make the right decisions on whether to implement a new technology. Um, so, I think um, we need to understand how they 
how they work, how they perform, what's the sensitivity and specificity, and what is the added value of, of having, for instance, uh, an INH um, resistance detection also uh, up front, and how does it compare to, to how the workflow would do with, um, with Ultra and, um, and GeneXpert uh, XDR cartridge. Um, so I think that's the first barrier for these new technologies. Uh, we need to understand how they work. And then um, that's a WHO uh, review. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Morten. Um, I don't see any further questions in the chat. I wonder if and can I, I, I would like to give maybe our presenters an opportunity to ask questions if they have any um, or raise points that might have missed. Morten. I have a question. Um, I'm very interested in, um, in the the new portable X-ray systems, and if there is uh, perhaps Peter or someone who has some thoughts about the portable X-ray systems, which is basically a, a couple of laptops and um, an X-ray generator and a, and a portable uh, in a very portable system. If you have um, that setup. Um, how does that compare in terms of agility and, and speed to, to the standard sort of community X-ray bus uh, interventions? Do we understand fully how these models are, are best implemented? Yeah, Martin, I think that's a really great question. And I think we're seeing huge amounts of innovation in this space right now. So the many manufacturers are, are, are building and, and bringing to market so-called ultra portable devices, some with CAD software already baked inside so that you can use them, you know, in a household contact tracing setting or, or even in a very remote rural sort of setting as well. I'm, I'm going to give a plug out for the find uh, document I shared in one of my last slides, which gives a very nice overview of the implementation uh, approaches that you can use when considering different uh, digital chest X3 and, and CAD software that's on the find website. Um, I think the major barrier still here remains cost. You know, I, I got caught in quotes from, from two different manufacturers just last week for, for a trial. And, you know, these devices are still $60,000. $60, and, you know, that is a lot for, for, um, for, for a national TV program in a country like Malawi. So we need to, I think we need innovation to bring down costs here. And, and I believe it can be done. I agree. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much. I guess one last question for me is for Chipo, um, just around the community activities. And I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of as these new tools um, are adopted in countries, where do you see your, your, your organization playing a key role in terms of just, um, I know you help with uh, increasing demand, but when new tools are introduced in countries, do you play a pivotal role in you know, sensitizing communities around those? Thank you for the question. Um, as joint agents, we are there to ensure that uh, we reach out to the communities. So our uh, best strategy is always working with community-based cutters. And whenever there's a new tool, if we are given the platform, we can always do that. And it, there was a time when we even implemented the TB in the Mines grant where our community cutters were actually collecting sputum at what level. So given the opportunity, we can always do that. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Chipo. Um, we now four minutes over. Um, and I think um, just to maybe thank all our presenters for a wonderful webinar. And I think we've really heard about new strategies for um, TB testing or pest detection. Uh, there were talks about the new um, specimens that could potentially be used for, for testing. And uh, we heard of the extensive pipeline of tests um, that are coming up. We hope we will one day have a true point of care test that can be used in a deep rural clinic in uh, Malawi, Uganda, Vietnam, wherever. And so um, the other thing I also wanted to highlight is as these new diagnostic tools come to play, we are aware that there's also new, new treatments uh, for disease, shorter regimens, 
And we have the new short regimens for TB preventive uh, care treatment, such as 3HP and um, possibly 1HP coming out soon. And so, I mean, in, 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 as we also scale up CHP through a project we are doing as Oram Institute, the Impact for TB project, we are also looking out to these new strategies for case detection because it's quite pivotal uh, for the prevention activities we are implementing. Um, just in closing, uh, thank you again, everyone. We thank our guests who joined the webinar. I would like to thank my co-chair, Dr. Villain, from all the way from um, Find in Geneva our presenters from um, different countries, different organizations. We really appreciate you, the time you took to prepare for this session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks, Violet. If I can also, thank extend, you, thank can also you. extend a thanks to everyone as well and to my co-chair, Violet, as well for a fantastic session. I think my closing comment is really just to steal a quote from Peter Small. Um, at the G20 Indonesia talk yesterday around financing and investing in TB. And his, uh, his quote says that we, in order for us to bend the endemic curve downward, we need to bend the innovative curve upward. So I think that is really my take home message from today's session and for everybody who participated. And I'd like to say with the theme of investment, let us all invest our time and energy into uh, resolving our current situation with TB and ending TB for good. Thank you very much, Violet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.